Hi, Susan Finch here. I am the host today for SLMA Radio, and I'm very excited because we just met for the first time. I have Justin Gray, the CEO of LeadMD, with me today, and we are talking about a statement that he's made that only 13% of marketing automation programs are successful. Justin, let's talk about this. Sure thing. Yeah, Susan, uh, first off, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we can dive right into uh, the state of marketing automation, as, as you mentioned. So it's actually not our stat, but it is reinforced by a lot of benchmarking data that we do collect along the way. Um, that stat was put out in an ultimate stats guide that had, was distributed through HubSpot and a bunch of other different channels, just in terms of where people are seeing success with marketing automation. And I think it speaks more about what we, how we view marketing automation and how that's starting to evolve. Uh, it, then it does anything else. It doesn't necessarily say that we're bad marketers. It doesn't mean that you know we're, we're not we're not using the right tools. It simply means that we're looking at marketing automation in a way where we're still thinking it drives net new leads. And although it does that, marketing automation is very much more of a mid funnel influence based tool than a, a, a net new lead generator. So I think that's an alignment issue. I think that and it's also an understanding issue and I know it you know most of the companies you deal with are much larger but smaller companies and companies with fewer than 10 employees I don't think they always understand exactly what marketing automation is and what it isn't and I don't think there's a clear definition of it it's one of those terms that can mean many things or varying degrees of things to people but I think the biggest thing that people get confused with is the thought that marketing automation is their strategy. Right. And yeah. <laughs> if that's where you're starting, you're already doomed. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, mar marketing automation is not a magic wand by any means. No. So it, it's 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 a tool to automate process. It's a, it's a workflow engine. So if you've got a bad process, the tool is not going to do anything but amplify that bad process. Right. So that's where we start to see you know, buyers uh, sending emails back saying, hey, I just talked to your sales rep. Why are you sending me an intro to your business? Um, so it, there's a lot of, it can really expose those areas where we're struggling as marketers. So what we, what we always uh, propose is that you focus on process, focus on the people that are going to you know, design that process and carry out those actions, and then focus on the technology. That sounds like a good path. So I'm getting right to it, we were talking about what these things mean to everybody individually. To you, I know Jim wanted me to ask you the question, what is your definition of success? And that's such a broad question. Sure. I think we should narrow it down to in a marketing program. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, so I'll answer it from the broad level, but first I'll, right. I'll dive into to, uh, specifics. Specifics, I can't speak today. So I think the, the you know, each campaign or each program that you launch has a, has a determination of success. And if you, if you don't know what that is, number one, that's, that's the first area that, that marketers fail. So think of every one of those mini funnels, uh, you know, each campaign as that mini funnel. Like what are we driving that buyer to do? It might not always be raise their hand. It may simply be to, to read that piece of content, um, you know, to, to click on that link, uh, or just build awareness in general when we, when we talk about display advertising and, and different forms of retargeting. So I think that defining that success on a campaign level is really important. And then just from the, the broad sense, I think you know, marketing needs to focus on its influence on revenue. And I, and I stress influence. So everyone wants marketing source deals or you know, MQLs that turn into an opportunity. But I would say that, you know, again, marketing is much more of an attributive process. So let's give them credit for those influenced opportunities as well. And that brings me to a point that I, I run up against with clients when they're trying to measure success and decide what has actually worked. It's difficult when the part that's worked is the, the true engagement where you've shared something with somebody, they've shared it with somebody else, and you're not always tracking that. You don't know where these in-person, telephone, private conversations are going that actually leads people back to you, yet that's that has to be somehow, how do you factor that into the success of a campaign? I've, we have a sponsor for the SLMA and she says, the phone rings more since I've been advertising with you. Mm -hmm. Am I tracking every bit of it? No, but I know that's where it's coming from because of the type of people that are calling. Yeah. So I, I think there's, you know, again, that notion of influence is, is front and center there. So, you know, as you launch that campaign, you have to 
devise, is that going to be something that is going to build that buzz, that's going to build that awareness and, and, and determine that right up front. So it might just be that, you know, in, impressions is your success metric there. Uh, it may not be, you know, qualified leads or, or, or form fills or something a little bit more uh, uh, static. So I think that, you know, again, it's, it's just about defining that success of that individual effort. That makes sense. And, and measuring it. Well, and, and measuring it. Where do you see, though, one of the, the biggest obstacles? You might want, you come up with your plan, you're ready to implement it. What is the biggest obstacle as far as implementing? This isn't even getting to the measuring, the continuing on of the efforts. It's just from the beginning, just getting it in place. Yeah, so I, I think that actually I would, I would kind of refute that a little bit in that, you know, you have to work backwards. You have to know what you want to measure before you start that effort. Yeah, so, you know, how are we going to track that click? How are we going to determine how much that influence was worth in that total lead life cycle? That's something that, you know, is still, I think, in its infancy. And, and again, a lot of marketers aren't being incentivized for that influence, and they, and they definitely need to be. So let's figure out what we want to measure. And then let's build our campaign based around that outcome. That makes sense. You recently wrote a post and I loved it. You know, warning the rest of your company has absolutely no idea what marketing does. Right. And that really hit home because I work with a few clients and they have, you know, you have your tasks, you have yours, you have yours. And we all have the same common goal, yet they really don't know how they fit into each other or what marketing's overall plan is and where they need to jump in or just be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, that, that uh, article really came from an interview that I did as part of our monsters of funnel series with Maria Pergolino over at Aptis. And I was really surprised by her number one recommendation, which is share your, share your wins, share your strategy, you know, be an internal marketer first. And I think that that's really important. We hear about the outcomes. We, oh, we drove X number of leads. We, uh, you know, we've got this event coming up, but we really don't get a window into the strategy behind that marketing, like what, what we're expecting as the outcome, how did we perform against that benchmark, and what would we do differently next time? So I think it, that that education is just something that's fundamental, and we need to focus on it as marketers. Well, I know that Maria Pergolino is a big fan of the champions, you know, being championing Championing your internal team and right. making sure that you call them out to everybody else. We, you're right that we call out to the people that are out and about that are out publicly, but internally we forget that they really need to hear it. Yep. Yeah. We and, ring a bit, we ring a big bell for sales and, you know, marketing launches the campaign in the dark. So it, it definitely, we're setting ourselves up for failure, even if we do succeed. Uh, so it really is important to, to that, that education begins with the internal element you know it begins sharing why why we're doing a certain effort you know we see this advertising or we see uh, uh content being produced and everyone kind of feels like yeah marketing just gets to to, to play around all the time but you know there, there's a strategy behind this so sharing that insight and making your company more uh you know you're upping your marketing iq it uh it, it again it, it it makes us each a marketer I agree. I'm going to take a quick break here. This is the SLMA radio show. I'm Susan Finch, your host today with my guest, Justin Gray from Lead MD, and a quick word from our sponsors. Whether you're producing a seminar series, users conference, lunch and learn, or exhibiting at a trade show, Validar has a solution. From capturing leads at trade shows to managing on-site registration, tracking session attendance, gathering feedback, and providing sponsors lead retrieval, we have a full suite of solutions for you. Since 2005, Validar has been turning corporate events and trade shows into better business. Call 888-784-2929 or visit us at Validar.com. The Vanilla Group, Inc. is the only firm that delivers telebased lead generation programs exclusively for enterprise technology providers. They achieve results five times higher than industry standards for outbound lead generation based on the research published by implementing their unique Telesales 2.0 methodology. The Vanilla Group is an award-winning leader in this space, and they get results like no other firms. The Vanilla Group supports firms from Fortune 500 companies to startups. To learn more, visit buildpipeline.com or call 
888-335-0340. That's 888-335-0340. Okay, we're back here. I'm Susan Finch. I'm your co-host, well, host today for SLMA Radio with my guest, Justin Gray from LeadMD. And we are talking about why only 13% of marketing automation programs are successful. So, Justin, that's a big number that are not successful. Right. <laughs> that's seven. That's 87%. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do these things fail? Where, where does it happen most frequently? Yeah, so I think it really... For me, there's, there can be a bunch of different failure points in there, but I think mo it's squarely at the, at the epicenter there, it's because we're expecting immediate results. And you know, again, marketing is, is an influence process, it's attributive, it happens over, think about your sales cycle, right? So like we internally have a 60 to 70 day sales cycle on average. Um, someone is evaluating that need far, be, you know, far before they actually speak to someone, and we've all heard those statistics. Um, so if we're expecting all of a sudden someone to see an ebook, download it and say, oh, wow, I, I need help. It's a little bit utopian, you know, beyond utopian. So, you know, we need to focus on, on putting the effort, aligning our efforts to how our buyers truly buy, which is research over time. It is. And so that's the first stumbling block. Exactly. What I find, too, that if you get past that stumbling block and you actually – have a great plan, you know what the end re desired result is. So you have your plan of how to track it, how you're going to measure and see what the results are. I see that a lot of companies, especially, you know, marketing teams in small and large end the effort too soon. They think they're done right? just because they've you know made all these deadlines. Okay. You know, the article has been published. The show has been on the conference is over. The product has been launched. And they don't realize how much it just has to keep going. The conversation right. has to continue. Yeah, so I, 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 I totally agree, number one. Um, as, as a second point, I think, you know, marketing as, a, as an influence process throughout the, the early funnel, mid funnel, late funnel, and then even uh, prompting referral, prompting advocacy in the, in the, in the super late stages, and, and even those upsell and cross sell items can be extremely important. And that's just not typically how marketing has thought in the past. Um, I think that we're getting there. We're starting to see those results. Uh, I can tell you that the most effective thing that we did in 2014 was implementing a sales nurture, which is you know, not, not a replacement for our general nurture, which runs the gamut, but a very focused, a focused targeted nurture that prompted people to take that next step in the sales process. It, it looked like it was coming from the sales individual, and it was extremely effective. So that's just an area where marketing doesn't normally play. No, and the, the follow-up, I find it um, interesting when I have people that I think are done that didn't quite make it through the funnel and they fell off by the wayside and they're parked off to the side and something new that I do mm -hmm. all of a sudden rekindles that. But because my name kept going out there or my company or my client's name kept going out there, it was still familiar to them. And that trust, whether I saw it or not, was still building. Sure. They, yeah. they saw it as a long-term these people are here for the long haul. They didn't just, you know, come and try and contact me. I said no, and they went away. They've continued on. Right. Yeah, I think that's, so a couple of points there. So one of the, our most powerful things that we do is, is uh, uh, what I call modern day PR, which is placed articles, you know, uh, syndicated content. Uh, it's really creating and, and disseminating our message through trusted channels, right? Um, I think that PR for me is one area that is incredibly valuable that most executives cut first because it's often not tangible. And I think it speaks to what you're, what you're speaking about right there um, in terms of like, if you don't get that immediate result, we, we cut it. We, we think it's not successful, but there's that notion of buzz. And I think some people are really good about feeling if that buzz is building, the rest right. of us need analytics. So if we can measure, you know, the, the eyeballs that we're reaching, uh, the ability for those individuals to come back to our site eventually and attribute that to that article they originally read, that's the nirvana there. And, and that's what we need. So when I talk about working backwards, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, I want to determine how that article is going to influence a sale six months down the road. And I build my campaign based on that type of tracking. I, I started in marketing, you know, so many years ago, going back to the 80s, when you would actually place a press release out there. 
right. send it through the proper channels, and then the results would get mailed to you as you would get hits and the bingo cards and the different things. And I was always shocked even then how two years later you would still get hits on an article because what does it do? It sits in a doctor's office. It sits at the hair salon. And mm-hmm. so the article still gets hit. And I think that's one of those, like you were saying that instant gratification, people, companies do themselves a disservice. And especially when they do cut that PR budget first, it is one of the most difficult things to track yep. what that reach is. And it, there's a lot to be said for that gut feeling. You can you can tell if you've been in it long enough. You can tell when it's building. You can you can tell by who is sharing your content, and their level of authority, and their and who how many people follow them. I mean, if I have you know like my neighbor down the street sharing something, big deal. But if Guy Kawasaki shares something that I say, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah agreed. And and I think that that's you know that's where the art and science of marketing really come together, right? You have a good marketer that that can feel that momentum building. But they also know that they need to show those those metrics to their team, to the rest of the company, and justify that spend. So you know we can never do one or the other, right? Like you need an intuitive marketer, and I, I feel strongly that those both sides of those that brain is what creates great marketers. That's where you see that professional marketer starting to to develop. You know we see marketing as a, as a skill set now rather than just a, a, a displaced. Uh, communications major uh, in the past, um, so I, I think that that's that's really exciting. Where you, where you can marry those two very disparate skills, uh, you know, great stuff happens. It's more creative than I think some of us get credit for. Right. The you know strategic content placement and just looking for great venues. It isn't so much trying to trick or spin everything to fit. It's truly looking for a good match. Right. To yeah, build we, those long-term relationships. Yeah, we did a piece of content called Monsters of Funnel, and it's one of our best performing influence pieces out there. Um, and, and the entire reason is it's fun. It's something that, uh, you know, it has a spin on, you know, 80s rock and roll and uh, just really brought in a bunch of, you know, top thought leaders, positioned them as a band. Uh, but at the end, you've got a tactical guide to, to bringing your funnel into the modern day. And I think that that, that combination of, of fun and interesting with tactical outcome is the recipe for success. I agree with you on that. We're getting close to the end of the show and there's a big question that a lot of people have and it's from companies large and small depending where they're at, but it's the same question. Can the average marketing department without a marketing operations team can manage a marketing automation program? Um, The short answer, yes. Um, I think that, you know, the efficiency of process is key. It's about not measuring the things that don't matter and really focusing on what does. So I think it's the same is interesting, but before this, I, I was sitting down with um, Craig Rosenberg, the funnel holic. And uh, he was talking about an interview that he's he did. <laughs> he was talking about an interview that he did uh, where someone asked him, you know, how do you find the time to write? And you know, his answer was simply, do you want to succeed or not? Right. Um, so I think the answer is the same when you're talking about marketing automation, like these are skill sets the marketer is going to have to have. So, you know, we, we need to invest the time, we need to use the tool, we need to show the results from the tool as well. Um, and, and you're never you're never too small to, to institute some level of automation, whether that's an enterprise platform, I would caution against over prescription there. Um, I'd really focus on get your process tight, you know, get you and, and a couple other folks that are, are really great marketers, content writers, designers, um, outsourced if you need to and then buy the technology that's right for you that you can see yourself using for the next two to three years at least. So something that will scale, um, but you don't have to shoot the moon if it's not within your your realm to manage. You don't have to start with the full package. And I liked what you said at the beginning of that answer was you don't need to do it all. Figure out what you don't need to do first. Get that out of the list and see what's left. Especially today with all, I mean, everyone's got an app, everyone's got a platform, all, there's all this software. Um, I feel more than ever people are starting to check boxes, you know, oh, I've got that social tool, I've got that marketing automation, but are, what, what do you really need to do your job? Focus on that before we add all the bells and whistles. I think you'll find more often than not, it's interesting content aligned to the right buyer at the right time. And that really only takes two platforms, CRM and marketing automation, and then what you bring to it in terms of content and design and just overall strategy. I think that's great advice. 
So I think that's what we're going to leave everybody with today. Justin, what is the best way for people to reach you if they want to follow your content or they just want to connect with you and maybe ask you a question or share your great stuff? Yeah, uh, so you can check out leadmd.com. We've got a, an awesome repository of best practices there. Uh, we've got a new repository going live on uh, November 25th, which I think will redefine the way uh, companies produce a resources area. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Or on Twitter, you can check uh, leadmd at, at myleadmd or myself at jgraymatter. This has been a wonderful show. Thank you. I always enjoy and get charged up when I speak to people like you, like Craig Rosenberg, like Maria. You get me focused again, realizing that I can let some of the bells and whistles and the shiny things drop by the wayside. Yep. And focus on what matters. So thanks. Thanks, Susan. I definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been the SLMA radio show with my guest, Justin Gray of LeadMD. And I'm Susan Finch, your host. Be sure to check out our website slmaradio.com to see all the replays or our main site, the slma.com. Thank you so much.